be a career teaching finance. That is pretty badass. <laughs> that is that is pretty cool. You've put a lot of time and effort in, my friend, not just on this book, but uh, in life. Um, what are folks saying about your book? Well, they really enjoy it because it's a down-to-earth book on uh, the challenges I faced as a young person and then uh, the challenges I faced as an adult when uh, the recessions of the late six, uh, 70s and 80s uh, caused me to uh, uh, get canned a couple a couple of times, which eventually, uh, ironically, because of that, uh, there, was a, there was an opening at Ramapo College on an emergency basis in uh, the fall of 1985, and what was an emergency appointment for three years turned into a full-time career, which was my goal when I decided to go to graduate school in 1972. So in many ways, um, it's a, my book's about uh, perseverance, uh, positive mental attitude, and uh, having some good luck along the way, meeting the right people who opened up some doors. And then uh, my own curiosity in uh, finding out what, what makes the world tick, what makes people tick. And so that's why I've been writing and speaking and uh, doing interviews. And uh, it's, it's been a great uh, ride to uh, be an educator, educating in the classroom and now using the airwaves and in print media to educate the public about some of these b big issues, uh, medical care, taxes, spending, uh, the Federal Reserve and uh, foreign policy, all the things that are in the news every single day of the week, I've been writing about them for uh, almost a half a century, believe it or not. And um, I hope to get a lot more traction uh, over the next several years because uh, we, are, we are at that proverbial crossroads in America. And the, depending on what road we take, that's what's going to decide what America is going to look like over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Well, one of the things that... Uh you mentioned, which I, I would love to get your take on, is the Federal Reserve. Uh, so many people do not understand about the Federal Reserve. Uh, give us a little bit more details on, on your side of things, my friend. Well, if you recall, the uh, Federal Reserve uh, was created when Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson, signed the Federal Reserve Act on December 23rd, 1913, right before Christmas. It was his first year in office. And the reason we have the Federal Reserve is because after the Panic of 1907, uh, the bankers were really um, in, a, in a panic because uh, their model of doing business was collapsing. We had banking panics throughout the 19th century, and the reason we had banking panics is because banks have a very uh, unstable business model. They borrow money from the public short term and lend it out long term. So they, they never have enough money in reserve to meet the demands of depositors. And so people, when they got nervous about the uh, 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 solvency of a bank, would go and try to get their gold out or their silver out. And the banks didn't have enough money and uh, the banks collapsed. That's why you have bankruptcies. They ruptured the bank. <laughs> and so in 1907, we had a huge panic and uh, J.P. Morgan essentially bailed out uh, a good portion of the banking system. The bankers got together in a secret meeting in Jekyll Island off the coast of uh, Georgia and laid out, the blueprint, laid, laid out the blueprint for the Federal Reserve, which then became the model for the legislation that Wilson signed in 1913, creating basically a private corporation. The bankers control it with oversight from the federal government, but they have a power that we don't have as individual citizens. That is the ability to create money. In fact, if we create money, it's called counterfeiting. When they create money, it's called easy credit and yes. easy money. There's no difference between <laughs> the private citizen creating money and the Federal Reserve creating money, except the Federal Reserve does something even more insidious. They manipulate interest rates in order to stimulate uh, production and consumption, which always ends in a crash, whether it's a stock market crash like uh, two, uh, 1929, 1987, or 2007, 2008. It always ends badly. You create, they, they create these levels which are unsustainable because prices are inflated to levels that can only be sustained with more and more money being created by the Federal Reserve to support the higher and higher prices. And then eventually the party comes to an end. And this has been going on for the past hundred years since the Federal Reserve was created. And it's time for the American people to understand that this is not an institution that is our friend. And uh, the reason that people think that the Federal Reserve is necessary is because of the Great Depression, where the Federal Reserve came in and pumped in a lot of money, which didn't cure the Depression, by the way. But uh, economists have been uh, lauding the Federal Reserve as a necessary 
economic institution to, quote, stabilize the economy, and it's done anything but stabilize the economy because people think that the free market is unstable. That is probably the most pervasive myth in Congress, in, on Wall Street, in academia, and uh, in other places. And that's why uh, most people support the Federal Reserve when, in fact, the Federal Reserve has been proven, given its actions and the consequences of its actions, to be harmful to the economy for long-term st stability and uh, prosperity. So I've been writing about it. Others have been writing about it for decades before I started writing about it in the 1970s. And the Federal Reserve has what we all wish we had, an unlimited checking account. We mortals have to earn our money. The Federal Reserve just creates money out of thin air. <laughs> Actually, it, it has something that's wonderful today for the, their perspective. They can literally create a trillion dollars at a snap, at a push of a button by buying up government debt. And that money is, is then deposited in the banking system. So the banks then become flush with money and uh, interest rates will go down in order to lend out that money. And this is what's been going on. They don't create a trillion dollars overnight. But they did create several trillion dollars in 2020 because of the lockdowns and uh, you had an implosion in the economy and they came along and said, well, the federal government is borrowing all this money. There's not enough savings around, so we're going to buy up some of the debt. And that's when we're off to the races uh, for the past uh, few years. And that's why inflation reached its, high, its highest level in 40 years because of all this money that's sloshing around the economy, uh, looking for a home, bidding up real estate, building up, uh, bidding up. Uh, antiques and uh, other uh, collectibles, and uh, prices have gone through the roof. Plus, you had the supply chain problem, c courtesy of the Biden administration, which caused supply to be uh, lower than it otherwise would. So you have a double whammy of more money, increasing demand, and lower supply, lowering supply, that causes prices to go up. So you had the worst of both worlds uh, under uh, Trump, where the money creation began, and under Biden, but the money creation is the result of the Federal Reserve's policies. And so we know that the Federal Reserve is not as independent as people think they are. We have got a very, very smart and interesting guest with us today. Murray Sabrin is with us. He's got an entire incredible new book. It is called From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, an American Story. And he joins us today here on our big broadcast. So the banks, they... I love the way that you explained that earlier, where you said the banks can just create money. If ordinary people create money, it's called counterfeiting. <laughs> that is that is excellent. Um, what do you think people should be wanting the Federal Reserve to do, or should we get rid of the Federal Reserve? How, how exactly should that work? for quite a while, is they should stop creating money, they should stop manipulating interest rates and allow the marketplace, the financial markets, to determine the level of interest rates, especially at, uh, for short-term debt. Remember, th they focus on short-term debt, the Federal Reserve, by pumping mo reserves into the banking system or, or taking money out of the banking system by selling uh, th their portfolio of assets, which then draws down the checking accounts of people who... Uh, who are in the banking system. So the way to do this is for the Federal Reserve to cease and desist manipulating interest rates and let interest rates find their own natural level, if you will, in the financial markets. Uh, Ron Paul, former Congressman Ron Paul and presidential candidate, has written a book about ending the Fed and so have other economists saying the, the, the Federal Reserve is not needed because in a modern and industrialized economy, money should be, pl should be supplied by the marketplace, by people in the marketplace. What does that mean? It means that we should have some tangible commodity as the basic money uh, instrument in the economy and then have money substitutes, which are checking accounts and savings accounts, that, can, uh, that are the basis for our transactions. We, people did, and then we had gold coins in the past, silver coins, which uh, I remember as a kid we had silver coins. We didn't have gold coins because it was illegal back then to own gold until that was lifted on December 31st, 1974, and now we could use gold. Remember, the dollar was initially defined as one twentieth of an ounce of gold. So the dollar is not an entity in and of itself, but it represents a particular commodity that the government chose as the premier money in the in in the in uh, the country. And that and the gold has been used for hundreds, hundreds of years because it is 
high weight per unit, it's portable, it's homogeneous. All the qualities that the textbooks tell us what a money should be, gold fulfills that uh, that uh, criteria. And so does silver and, and copper to a certain extent as well. And so um, if we go back to a gold standard, it'd be relatively easy to do that. It would just mean defining the dollar again as a unit weight of gold, and the Fed would no longer be able to inflate the supply of dollars because you would need gold in the banks and then the, uh, the central bank, if you're going to ha have the Fed, and they would issue paper money, or I should say paper substitutes, money substitutes, that would represent how much is in reserve. And if we had that, then we would have sustainable prosperity, we wouldn't have uh, volatile interest rates, and we would have the best economy in the world. Now, we can do this on an international basis, but the powers that be, uh, the financial people, uh, don't want a gold standard because they're very happy with the current uh, system because they make a lot of money because they, they're one of the initial recipients of the new money and so the stock market goes wild the bond market goes wild and they make oodles of money at the expense of the general public in fact uh, because the federal reserve kept interest rates at close to zero percent for so many years this was the greatest transfer of, of wealth in the history of our country as savers like you and me, we're getting zero on our money market accounts and savings accounts, and that money was used to uh, uh, for speculation in the stock market and drove up stock prices. So the financial elites made out like bandits, so to speak, and the average person couldn't get a decent return on their savings, which meant that they were losing purchasing power each year because if inflation is 2 3% and you're getting zero, you're losing 2 3% in purchasing power of your savings account. You were still losing purchasing power because right now inflation year over year is six percent and we're getting around four percent on in money market accounts so we're still behind the eight ball even though the fed has raised interest rates for the past two years so it's a it's a real financial mess and um, we need to have a national dialogue on this issue and if we do then you bring in experts who support the fed who are critical of the fed or who want to end Fed, and let's have something on C-SPAN where you could have a day-long uh, conference where people can present uh, their sides of the issue and let the American people judge what's best for them. We have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here in our broadcast. Murray Sabrin is with us. He's the author of From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, an American Story. And uh, fairly recently, there, there was uh, this individual who has basically just come out of nowhere, and now they're running for the GOP bid for the presidency in 2024. Who in the... And I know I'm going to butcher this name, because I've never seen this name. <laughs> Vivek Ramsmy? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it doesn't even sound like a, it doesn't even sound like a name that even could be put on a ballot. <laughs> well, it's it's it's, it's uh, again it's it's uh, an Indian ethnic name, and so um, uh, our name was Shabrinsky when we came to America. So uh, yes, I I, yes. I, I, I yeah. can understand how people can uh, uh, can mispronounce names, but yes. the point is, yes. I heard him on uh, Tucker Carlson show announce his candidacy, and. Um, uh, he made a few good points about the wokeness that's going on in America and how our culture has shifted dramatically. I'm a lot, I'm a lot older than he is, so I've seen it for, since the 1950s, how our culture has changed. And uh, we, need, we need to have a, a, a basically a, a, restoring, a restoration, if you will, of good cultural values. And now what are those? I mean, it's one of honesty, probity, um, self-control, self-discipline, uh, respect for other people. But and not shoving uh, our ideas down people's throats as as the left has been doing for for decades, and we need to have a a, a, a country based upon the principles of, that the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, Article One, Section Eight, authorizes what the federal government can spend money on, and unless anyone talks about it, they're just spinning their wheels because we have a constitutional crisis in America that no one in Washington wants to even uh, bring up. In in terms, let alone address, namely the federal government's budget is not consistent with what they can do legally based upon the Constitution. And that includes Social Security, sacred cows of Medicare, Medicaid, and most military spending, which is not authorized to prop up a, a country like Ukraine or any other country around the world, and all these entitlement programs that we have. Uh, the problem we have James, is that we have a country where pe adults are being treated like 
children and, and they're being taken care of the, by the government. And that's not the way I was brought up in the 50s, where I saw my father go to work for, and be out of the house 12 hours a day. And then he drove a cab on the weekends to provide for the family. And so he had a very strong worth ethic, which I think I, I've uh, embraced for the past uh, for all my life. And uh, that, that's the problem we have today. People want something for nothing. And uh, that is a very dangerous cultural trait to have because what it means is that people expect the government to provide more and more benefits for them as they go through life. And uh, self-sufficiency, I don't mean where you're clustered individually, but in a society you have interpersonal relations throughout uh, your life. And those are the voluntary relationships that we have that are valuable, that give us comfort, that give us uh, hope that we will have a much better life in the future. Instead, the government says, don't worry, we're going to take care of you. You don't have to worry about building a community in, in your uh, where you live, but we're going to come down, come from Washington and give you everything we need from health care to education to food stamps to housing to transportation. And they don't believe in markets. They don't believe in free enterprise, even though Joe Biden in the State of the Union address said, I'm a capitalist. Well, if he really believes that, he would say it's time to now downsize the federal government because it's not consistent with the principles of free enterprise. We have got a great guest with us today. Murray Sabrin is with us. He's the author of From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, an American Story. So what do you think about the way that uh because we were talking about you know the money what do you think about money in politics because it seems like there's two ways to look at it there should be the let's just let everybody you know let's get rid of all the money and just do public financing of elections and then there's people that are on the other side which is well corporations are people too <laughs> what do you think about all this and money in politics, because it just seems like it, it becomes a situation of whoever's got the most money can run for president or office, you know, of any kind. Yeah, uh, I've been a very uh, a big critic of, of uh, camp, the way campaigns are structured in America. I haven't been a political candidate myself in, in New Jersey in the past. What I suggested to a reporter when I, after one of my campaigns to say, listen, the American people should be educated about the positions, the policy positions of the candidates. Why don't the newspapers every Sunday have a section devoted to the each issue and the candidates writing what they believe and what they want to do that as is a awesome. congressman, as a senator, as a president, as a governor, as a state legislature, le legislator, and let the public decide. And then the candidates agree to going to town hall forums around the state, around the country for the presidential candidates, without scripted, where the average person will ask a question of the candidates, and they will have time to do it. Uh, the debates are a, a terrible format. The public should be grilling the candidates on one-on-one, -on -one, and the candidates should be presenting their ideas. No one of these 30-second dopey commercials on TV or radio. <laughs> we don't need them. We need to be educated. Having been an educator virtually all my adult life, it's important to stand in front of the people, uh, in, not in a, uh, a classroom setting, but in a political setting, saying, this is what I believe in, this is what I think should be done to, to make the country better, and here's, a, here's why what I'm proposing proposing is better than what my opponents are proposing. That's it. And go into the litany of why we should uh, reform the Fed or end the Fed. Why should we cut taxes? Why should we get rid of uh, government agencies that have no constitutional basis? Why should we not intervene in countries around the world and give, give reasons for that? And this way you get rid of the dopey sound bites on, on, uh, in these ads and you don't have to hire political consultants. It's you and the candidate. Uh, just like your uh, co companies have to sell their product or services to the public, the candidates have to sell themselves by giving them full disclosure of what they believe in. That is awesome. That is fantastic. Uh, you mentioned a uh, situation there about, you know, letting folks, you know, be able to see people's opinions of things in the newspaper, which I think is, is amazing. Uh, what would happen if you had a candidate that was running that decided, you know, I'm not going to consent to this. 
does the newspaper or the the media company put something up that says, "Hey, they didn't consult to an interview," or how how would you how would you counter something like that? Uh, m- my position is very clear on that. If you're unwilling to debate, if you're unwilling to present your ideas to the public, you're not worthy of public office. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> uh, if, 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 yes. you can't, if you can't, uh, if you don't want to persuade the public about your uh, public policy position, then you have no business running for office. And, um, and enough of the BS that we get from candidates. I mean, uh, uh, Biden is the bi- biggest BS artist that we've seen in, 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 in public life. I mean, yeah. er- virtually everything that comes out of his mouth is not based upon fact. Um, and so um, he, he, he couldn't get away with what, uh, what I'm proposing as a candidate because he would have to face the, the public and, and answer questions about uh, all his policies. I mean, his, his really lunatic policies. In fact, uh, Joe Biden is of really two people. The foreign policy of John McCain and the domestic policy of Bernie Sanders. That's who <laughs> Joe Biden is. And uh, that, to me, is a dangerous mix. He wants the welfare state to expand, and he wants the warfare state to expand. And Joe Biden may go down in history as one of the worst presidents ever because he's, he's taken us to the brink of nuclear war. Speaking of that, what, what do you think of all this that, that, that's going on with these, you know, the United States is building up troops uh, near Taiwan, and, and you have all, all the... All the weird money we're giving you the Ukraine, but yet we could we could take some of the money. We literally could we literally could take a little bit of the money that we gave Ukraine and wipe out homelessness. <laughs> uh, no question about it. You know what? It's so insane to me. About you know what's so ironic about the Taiwanese situation, the Taiwan situation yeah. is China considers Taiwan a province of mainland China. So they consider Taiwan ha- a being uh, a renegade area from the mainland, from the uh, from the central government. Well, didn't Lincoln uh, have a war against um, the South because they want to secede from uh, from the Union? <laughs> and so it's ironic that China is now saying this this uh, island na- uh, area should remain part of China. So the United States, given its history with um, uh, not allowing the, the South to secede should welcome china saying hey we want we want to take back a, a, a renegade part of uh, china so that's the irony there and with the ukraine since when did ukraine become the 51st state of america this is what i want to know <laughs> who slipped that in to the to the uh to the constitution to the uh to the uh to the amendments to, uh, or whatever to, to get a state approved we had alaska and hawaii become states through the constitutional process we certainly haven't had it with ukraine and I think the American people are, are seeing that uh, Joe Biden doesn't care about the people of Ohio who, who uh, are, are affected by this uh, toxic uh, spill that occurred. Yes. While well, he went over to Ukraine and Poland and basically said, uh, we're going to fight uh, uh, with you. Uh, either." And, and the thing is, uh, there have been reports that American advisors are in civilian clothes in Ukraine. If that's the case, um, we effectively are in a war with Russia. In fact... The United States and, England and the UK declared war on Russia by blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline. And we have evidence that, that yes. they did it. Yes, that is just so, insane to me. <laughs> that, that, that's is, the, that is that's going 20, on. That's the 21st century equivalent of uh, the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Um, with, with, and, of course, the ecological disaster with all the gas uh, flowing into the atmosphere. So you wonder where all the environmentalists are about uh, <laughs> the, the policies of the Biden administration. So... Um, uh, I, 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 I hold the Biden administration in great contempt because I've seen administration after administration in my lifetime, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, uh, uh, the Biden administration uh, is doing everything wrong. There's nothing right about the Biden administration. And the fact that he has so much still has support among the American people is just shocking to me, is that wh- where are people getting their information and what do they understand about the world that we live in overseas and uh, domestic policy? Uh, I guess as long as we don't have a, a huge meltdown in the stock market or a huge um, rise in unemployment, uh, people uh, don't mind what's going on because yeah. it doesn't affect them uh, directly, but uh, they should wake up because um, I think we're headed for a major financial crisis over the next several years. We have got a great guest with us today. Murray is just amazing. He hits it out of the park every time we have him on the show. 
The book is amazing from immigrant to public intellectual. Uh, you, you just, you, I, I normally I would say you should run for office, but you have. <laughs> yes. No, well, right now I, I have, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the mission to restore the Republic. Uh, and so thank you for the opportunity to, uh, get my ideas of cross of solutions, not just criticism, but solutions. Solutions. Make America That's right. A better place. That's right. It's, well, I, I definitely would love to have you back because I know that Don Mazzella was excited as punch to talk to you today, but he he had some scheduling issues and couldn't line it up today. But I definitely will be in touch so we can get you and Don together. Uh, really appreciate the time, Murray. Before we let you go, how do people get your book and get involved with you on the social media, websites, everything? Great. The books available on Amazon, including my uh, four other books, uh, actually five other books that were published. They're all available on Amazon. Uh, the first book uh, in 1995 on how to create a tax-free America, including, how, and then I wrote books on healthcare, how we can have a better healthcare system, and then how people can understand the boom-bust cycle. And now my autobiography, which ends with the 97 uh, gubernatorial campaign in New Jersey, where I was the first third-party candidate to uh, get into the debates with uh, the major party candidates. And so... Uh, and then on Substack, I write uh, twice a week on Substack, murraysabrin.substack.com. People can follow me there and, um, and hopefully uh, uh, join me and, uh, in this journey to make America a better place than what the politicians have, have, been, have been doing to America for the past 100 years. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, Murray, thanks for doing this, brother. It's always a pleasure, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Have yourself a blessed day, my friend. Thank you, James, and uh, you stay uh, warm uh, wherever you are, and, uh, and uh, I know there's some bad weather around the country. Hopefully you're not affected by it. Yes. Well, Murray, have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, brother. There he goes. That is Murray Sabrin. He joins us today here on our big broadcast, and we were doing a, um, a test on a rumble today, and apparently that worked, so we may do that more. So, that is that, and we will see you next time here on our world-famous Jiggy Jaguar Radio Broadcast.